Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Smith. This is ModX Network Voices. It's where we highlight experts in the field. And today we have an excellent guest, Daniel Hall from the ETH, ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. He's going to be joining us. As usual, I have my partner here with us, Ivan Rupnik. Ivan, you like to hey, say Ryan. hi? Hi, Ryan. Uh, and it's a great opportunity, of course, for folks to learn a little bit about what's going on uh, across the pond and see uh, what relationships can develop between academia and industry. I'd like to introduce Daniel Hall here on the call. Um, and uh, he's an American working in Switzerland, uh, as I understand it, Daniel, and he'll introduce himself a little bit um, and tell us a little bit about his lab. So Daniel, if you just tell us your story a little bit, that'd be great. You can screen share now or whenever you're ready and uh, We'd love to, to engage in a discussion with you. Great, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Ryan, and thanks for having me um, here. Um, it's really uh, it's really nice to be able to talk uh, with the Mod X community, who I've been keeping an eye on for uh, for the last uh, year, two years or so uh, since uh, since it's been formed. Um, yeah. So Daniel Hall, I'm an assistant professor at ETH Zurich, and you're right. So I'm a I'm an American um, Californian. Uh, by birth, um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, you asked if I could tell a bit of my story. So I was um, always intending to be a structural engineer until I graduated in 2008, and uh, then found out there was no jobs in 2008. Um, worked in construction for several years, uh, and then I went back um, to school to get a master's degree in uh, 2012 at Stanford University. And that quickly turned into a, a PhD and, uh, and ended up uh, staying around in academia. Um, so from my side, uh, it was a very interesting journey and I could say a little bit about how I got into the topic of industrialized construction. Um, heading all the way back to um, my PhD, which was not necessarily on industrialized construction, I was looking at innovation and innovation in construction was what really um, interest me the most um, and in particular I was looking at kind of innovations that crossed over the supply chain so innovations that required people to work together in different ways um, we, we call them systemic innovations um, and particularly why these kind of really interesting innovations were not getting adopted in construction um, and I began by looking at maybe we could find other ways uh, other kind of project delivery models that would enable this um, and the focus of my PhD was on integrated project delivery, which I, I think many of your listeners are familiar with or, or know about. And I found some compelling evidence that integrated project delivery helped with these innovations. But what was always frustrating to me was that these project teams would come together, and even if they were the most collaborative teams that you've ever put together, at the end of the project, they, they stopped working together, um, they all went to the next project, and they almost never worked together again. Um, maybe you could have a couple people, but um, you know, in the end, the projects really would split apart. And so all of the knowledge that they created with these innovations um, would just get lost uh, and kind of disappear um, because it was all tacit within people's, within people's minds. So that was kind of the interesting thing that I noted um, and was noticing as I was doing my PhD research. And I was wondering how do we solve kind of this longitudinal um, problem where we, we need to have innovations that build upon each other and don't get lost when the project is done. Um, and uh, that led me um, to be really interested in this idea of industrialized construction. I was seeing a lot of these prefab innovations, but they were not making it very far in the market. Um, and then uh, in 2014, um, I had a, a fortuitous uh, uh, a class that I took at Stanford. This class was titled Industrialized Construction. Here, I'll, I'll share my screen now. Um, let's see. And uh, this was uh, Jörger Lessing, um, who at the time was finishing his PhD and was a visiting scholar at Stanford. Um, and he was uh, teaching a, a guest course at Stanford called Industrialized Construction. Um, and to me, this was like uh, really a really revolutionary idea, the idea that you could have 
uh, product platforms, that you could really be a product development company in construction, um, and that uh, you could create kind of a, a stable continuity that would improve from project to project. Um, and we could say more about that later, but for me, that it was really interesting. And then at the same time, we had some great, uh, we had some great startups that were coming and speaking in our class. So there were companies like Connects Tech, Project Frog, um, and some others that, that we had joining us as guest lecturers in the class. And for me, that was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot from it, but I noticed one thing, and that was that we, these companies were coming and talking to us, um, but they were not necessarily talking to one another. And uh, we had some really, uh, really interesting things to be shared, but we weren't necessarily finding a way to create a community around this industrialized construction idea. So what I suggested we do at, at a certain point was I said, hey, what if we just got everyone together in a room, uh, let's call it a forum, and let's just talk about industrialized construction. And that led us to the, the very first industrialized construction forum in 2014. Here's the picture in, uh, at Stanford. Um, sparsely attended, uh, I think we had about 25 attendees. Um, maybe, maybe we got up to about 30. Um, but there was a real excitement in the room of people thinking about industrialized uh, construction, of companies coming and sharing about what they're working on. Um, a real learning environment, and we had a lot of startups and, and also um, well-established general contractors who were coming in who were interested. So that was the beginning of this industrialized construction forum. I thought it would maybe be a one-time thing, uh, but then everyone said, hey, that was really great. Um, you, should, you should do it again. <laughs> so, uh, so then I decided to organize it again in 2015. Um, and Ryan, I can't remember if you came that year or if you came the year after, but we were really happy to welcome you as a, as a guest. Um, one of those years, and, and the thing I noticed was that every year our attendance was doubling. So, uh, you know, the next year we were probably about uh, uh, 40 or 50, and then we were about 80. Um, and, you know, I think in 2018, that was when I really, um, I really realized we had something growing here. Um, and this is a picture from 2018. We were in, you know, much nicer, bigger conference room. Um, but what was also interesting is I got the attendee lists, and um, you know, I was noticing the kind of the names of the companies that were coming to our forum and, and um, you know, these were people from Google X um, and these were people from Samara, which was Airbnb's uh, startup um, and uh, or Airbnb's kind of spinoff here and uh, some other tech companies. And I'm thinking, what are they coming to our forum for? Why are they so interested in the built environment? Um, what's going on here? Um, but I think, you know, uh, if I could just say what I, what I think it was, is that the industrialized construction program has been a place for kind of the entrepreneurs, I like to say the tinkerers, the experimenters, who want to kind of come and, uh, and either share or, or, or hear some big ideas for construction. Um, we're not necessarily technical focused, we're not working on technical implementations, although we, we love to see people share what they've done technically. Um, but we're really a place for idea exchange, for big picture thinking, um, and uh, to really bring in uh, a lot of really interesting energy um, into this space. So we've continued to grow um, every year, and um, uh, that's, been a, that's been a really fun thing. So we just finished our sixth forum in 2020. Um, you know, I don't know what will happen in 2021. <laughs> we will see, but we continue to grow. Um, yeah, and so uh, that was really a key point um, uh, that became, started to become an interesting part of my research. Um, I think just as an example, one of the things I noticed is that there was these new business models that were emerging. Um, and these are just three that I captured in, in a paper recently. Um, we saw that, that uh, companies were, Kind of legacy general contractors were creating spin-off factories um, partnerships um, and uh, and kind of going that route we saw the total vertical integration routes um, 2000 uh, I think it was 2018 is when Katera announced their really huge funding rounds um, I think that certainly gave us a boost because people were saying wow if, if a company is gonna get you know in total 1.3 billion dollars from SoftBank um, you know maybe there's something here um, and then we also saw this really interesting kind of digital systems integration space where companies that weren't necessarily investing in manufacturing equipment and factories, uh, but were looking at integrating using software um, industrialized 
uh, 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 components together. And, um, this was this was kind of a third business model, and I would reference Project Frog, or in the UK you have Bright and Wood, who's been doing a lot of great stuff there. Um, so we we noticed that yeah. there's very different approaches in in the business model, um, and that's all been uh, that's all been kind of the start. So that's how the industrialized construction forum got started, um, and, and and where we went from there. That's great. And, you know, that's kind of your history there, Daniel. How did that lead to your current lab and your position at ETH? Yeah, great question. Um, so I've been here in Zurich for uh, two and a half years now. Um, when, I was, when I was finishing at Stanford, um, I was looking at academic positions, and uh, this, uh, this one definitely st uh, stood out to me, the Chair of Innovative and Industrial Construction. I thought, well, I've studied innovation. I've studied industrial construction uh, seems like a good fit I'm glad that they that they agreed um, and let me join um, and so we tried to carry a little bit of that over but I also would say coming to ETH to ETH uh, was really kind of a whole nother level um, we were seeing some startups um, in, in Silicon Valley um, really focusing on kind of the general market um, but ETH has, for the last uh, decade, I think, really pushed the envelope for digital fabrication and robotics. Um, and so coming there, it was really a, 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 a you know, eye-opening thing um, for this team um, that, that was working on things. So um, this is a, an example of the in-situ fabricator with a mesh mold. Um, many people have seen this on YouTube. Um, the, the big project that was ongoing when I first got there was the, the DFAB house. So this was a a building scale demonstrator of digital fabrication that was mm -hmm. um, designed and built with, uh, with DFAB um, in mind. It was permitted, it's now completed, and people live in the house. So um, to kind of take it beyond the laboratory and say, look, robotics, um, 3D printing, these things can be incorporated into, um, into real projects. Uh, and then you had things like um, spatial timber assembly. So you have two simultaneous robotic arms um, cutting and, and uh, placing uh, timber um, with a human interaction providing the, the drill in the end. Um, and so kind of how that's translated for me is that I have a, a strong pulse on the construction industry, on a little bit on how um, entrepreneurship, uh, venture capital, um, also new business models are entering. Um, and I think I came at a really nice time because while the, the lab work is truly, in my mind, um, state of the arts uh, that a lot of these uh, research teams are doing. Um, there's also a need to translate that to the industry. Um, and it doesn't necessarily happen by just kind of saying, hey, we built something, now you should build it too. It's actually a lot of work that has to be done in construction to translate this. Um, so the DFAP house has acted as a great learning environment. Um, and uh, just as an example of some of the research, um, you know, in the white shirt there, that's Conrad Grauser, who was the project manager for the, the DFAB house. And then um, he's now joined my chair and is doing his, his PhD, um, working on kind of understanding how does a project like the DFAB house come together and how does it challenge, overturn, or reinforce uh, the concepts that we think about when we think about construction and architecture. So um, that's really been a nice, a nice way that we've gotten some of the research started and become interconnected um, with the NCCR. Um, and so in the end, I think I mentioned, here's the house. I, I, got, to, I got to go for the opening night and uh, you can see it furnished and, uh, and people live in it now. So, um, and you could read uh, Conrad's paper. I put a link at the bottom if, you, if uh, any in the audience want to read. Um, it's about a 10 page uh, 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 paper in, in Fabricate about how the DFAB house project came together as well as references to a lot of the specific uh, robotics and digital fabrication technologies that were used for it. So um, yeah, so that was, it was a very interesting transition. Um, I've learned a lot here. Um, I think I've brought a little bit to help, um, help the, the, the collaborations move forward. Um, and we're, I think we're just getting started. I think there's a lot more to do. It's, just, it's amazing, amazing to see the resources you have uh, at your disposal. Uh, a very, I mean, I've, I've visited the, the fabrication space at the ETH and it's pretty, it's pretty serious. It makes uh, some of the other schools in the East Coast look a little bit amateur. I mean, Northeastern, we don't even have a robot arm, but even the big, big boys down in Cambridge 
certainly don't have those resources. But one thing I was going to ask you about, um, you know, you showed some models of businesses. One of the things we've been trying to do is model ecologies in terms of not just in terms of market share. That's kind of where we started, you know, whereas offsite construction, particularly high, highly prefabricated construction, highly penalized or volumetric, whereas high penetration. Uh, and so, you know, it's Japan. It's also the U.S., even though we're not very, but in the U.S., we're not very sophisticated. We have the lowest level, but high acceptance, and it has little to do with low quality of construction, low quality of, uh, and lack of labor. Um, and then in places, and then we've seen it in places like the U.K. and Sweden, um, but from our data, and we'd love to, for you to talk about it, the places like Austria, Germany, Switzerland, kind of where you're in the middle of, the quality of construction, the level of management, the, the general industrialization is quite high, and yet for prefabrication in general, is, the market share is quite low. Uh, there's a, you know, and I know more of the statistics of Germany, a little bit Austria. So, you know, the country, so Austria, the country that's invented CLT, the level of part market, the, the system of education is amazing. The level of market penetration is really low. Um, and so I'd love, you know, do you have, I mean, is that, is that your experience? What's your, what, you know, what's going on there? Like so much innovation, relatively little acceptance um and, and yeah. again in a very high quality of let's say conventional construction as opposed to the us where you know we, we can't even imagine what quality of construction is switzerland has and how high even the conventional builders are yeah i mean um you're exactly right uh, i'll first make a quick uh, comment about the funding structure i mean i was quite shocked when i came here so the 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 pictures you've shown and, and the defab house were funded through something called the NCCR, which stands for National Center of Competence and Research. Um, and this comes from the Swiss National Science Foundation. It's a 12 year funded research program. So you, there is nothing comparable to that from a national science uh, uh, funding scheme in architecture, especially in the US. Um, and 12 years is this lifespan of three PhD students. So you can think about when you can think about three consecutive PhDs on a topic, the, the way forward, the, the, amount of, of, um, the amount of progress that you can make through that. Um, and the center has 27 principal investigators. So um, I, I've joined as one of 27. Um, and we are from robotics, uh, you know, civil engineering, material science, computer science, architecture. Um, it's a level of, of interdisciplinary. I was just speaking with a, with a group internally today um, I, I kind of said, I think you take for granted how interdisciplinary this group is and how little that happens, definitely in industry, but even more so, it doesn't happen so much in academia. So, um, yeah, so, so I think that the, the funding t uh, pays, uh, it pays off. It tells, it tells an interesting story. Um, your, your larger question about the, the market penetration is exactly right. Um, I would attribute the quality is, is, is one factor there. Um, I would say materials is a really big impact. Um, so in Switzerland, especially, uh, concrete is, yeah. is the material of choice. Mm -hmm. um, and concrete is, you know, it can have some prefab and there are some prefab concrete companies, um, but really a lot of the innovation comes from timber, uh, but it's not a very well accepted building material here. Um, and so what happens is that these really innovative, interesting timber companies, um, our state of the arts, they operate either in kind of a small niche within, you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, or they look to external markets because that's where people will buy timber. So then they export um, their, their, their cap capacities. Um, so it's really interesting to see that. Um, I have a, a friend, Greg Howes, who, who um, went to uh, Innsbruck, I believe, for the Holzbau, and he talks about how there were, you know, 1,200 people there and like 20 Americans or something like this. He, this is his, uh, his line. He tells me a lot. Um, and he's been very <laughs> passionate about trying to connect um, the market in the U.S., which is huge, and looking for innovation with the technical skills um, in Europe and especially Central Europe. I agree. I see it as a huge opportunity. Um, but, you know, there are some challenges to, to, to overcome. Because, for example, uh, we met, we, we were planning a big event, and we will hopefully have a big event in Sweden, because Sweden, so Germany has the largest uh, off-site industry in terms of wood in Europe, but in the, it's entirely based on export. Uh, and Sweden has, it's through this, uh, the European Commission has, a, a, has pretty good data, better data than we do in the U.S. about prefabricated buildings, even though we have a bigger industry, which is kind of ironic. 
Whereas Sweden is the is unique in that it's managed to produce a self kind of a, a, a economically sustainable industry. It consumes its innovative product. It's it's actually quite unique in that world. Even though maybe Austria is some ways, you know, again is pushing the envelope of what a CLT building can do. There's a weird balance in Sweden between innovation and market penetration. And we spoke to the you know we we spoke to the commission. And the commission, you know, in 2020, in the next five years, and I know Switzerland isn't part of the European Union, but is, you know, even more progressive in terms of CO2, there's going to be a performance-based criteria for construction that will push people into wood. And yet, we all know in continental Europe, it's like 2 to 4% of market share. It's so yeah. low. And it's yeah. a lot of, it's a cultural factor. It's not yeah. a technical factor. It's not even economics. It's not even regulation. The fire protection exists. So, I mean, you know, is that something that's being investigated at the ETH? Because that seems to be all the great work's getting done, but is, you know, there's another part of it, which is just very, it's very architectural, it's very cultural. You can yeah. do all this work and how does it go? How does it grow? Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, um, I've heard that also one barrier with, with Switzerland is, um, is noise. So sound, there are sound codes about sound and they're very sensitive to, um, to being able to hear your neighbors. Um, so, uh, that kind of comes into play. But of course, as you mentioned, all these issues can be solved. Um, and I think we're seeing an increase in, in wood adoption. Um, I think we're, we are seeing, you know, more of a market share and acceptance. It's, it's increasing. Um, um, I know of a, a large project that's going to be done um, pretty soon, one of the largest timber projects in, in Switzerland. Um, I think also at the ETH, we're also looking at how concrete can be utilized. Um, the picture I showed a little while ago was what we call the smart slab. And um, this slab is a 3D printed um, formwork that optimizes for load. And in doing so can decrease the amount of concrete material used by 70%. So now you're talking about much less uh, CO2 impacts uh, while still keeping a lot of flexibility and, and kind of a new interesting architecture aesthetic. Um, so we are trying to think about also, you know, not just pushing um, timber only, uh, but thinking about what would a, a concrete innovation uh, look like, um, and so we do. I do see some some opportunities there, and and other applications of things like three D printing um, uh, coming on board. Um, yeah, Daniel. So you have this interdisciplinary team you're working in, and you are one PI among many, and so I'm sure work bridges across the various groups. But you as a PI, you as a lab. Uh, with PhD students and advising. What is the scope of what you are interested in and working on? You've been doing it for a couple of years and I'm sure you're gonna be doing it into the future. Uh, what is the scope of, uh, of offsite construction, industrialized construction topics uh, and innovation that you are, you are interested in? Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked and uh, I think it's a perfect cue up because I got a couple of slides as well. So uh, oh, okay, good. I'll, I'll throw those up there. Um, uh, because I think it's a little bit easier to kind of show it. Um, I, I titled it, uh, let's see. Yeah, I titled it Implications for the Future. These are really some of the things that we're working on now um, and that we see being really, really key um, for our lab in the future. Um, the first one is, is not new to anybody look, that's looked at industrialized construction, but it's from projects to product platforms. Um, the second one, which I think is, is a really key point here, is about sustainability and circular economy. Um, the third one is, is uh, quite new um, for me. Um, it, it gets a little bit into design, but it's about, about something between DFAB and mass customization. I'll say something about that in a little bit. And the fourth one is we're really looking at uh, kind of industry with disruption for entrepreneurs. And I think it's important to say, so I, I have a couple projects with the NCCR. Um, and the NCCR is really specifically focused on these digital fabrication robotics. Um, but the kind of larger scale approaches to, you, let's say, modular construction or things like that don't necessarily fall within scope. So I do those, I do those um, on, on my own. Um, those are kind of things that we do with, with, with my research group. Um, this is a, a diagram which has been around a lot, but I think it really shows um, the idea that we're used to information transferring downstream in the production process. So you go from design to engineering to production. Um, but what I really see the opportunity being is, is working on um, the research. How do we transfer rules and restraints upstream into the design space so that we can create fabrication aware design tools? 
Um, I think the current process where you start with design and then if you're, you know, you kind of get to the procurement stage and you hope that uh, it might work for modular, it might not. I mean, that's a fundamentally broken and wasteful process. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and we keep um, that way too, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, of course it can be, you can kind of try to make it work, but there's so much to be gained by really thinking about um, making these fabrication aware design tools. Um, and, and that kind of links here. I mean, this is just, if, if people aren't exposed to it, I like to show this idea of creating a product platform, you know, Legos is a good example. And then um, the, the platform designs the rules of the game, you know, how many dots uh, is how the standardization of the dots, the project kit kind of, you know, flows from that. And then you go towards the projects, right? So then you, then you can create different projects from the different um, kits. And that's really the idea of mass customization from a, from a product platform. And what I see the change happening, um, is this is what I mentioned earlier, is uh, I like to say that there's a shift on going from BIM as input to BIM as output. So BIM as input means that the process starts with BIM. You know, the, the designers start by putting something into a Revit model um, and you build on top of that over time and you aggressively add more detail. The whole idea of LOD, level of detail, is based on this idea that you start with a low level of, of detail and you move into greater levels of detail. And this is how we've done architecture and, and design to construction for a long time. Um, but, you know, this is my very quick, you know, back of a napkin PowerPoint sketch of um, coordination and information loss that occurs in that process and how much time it takes to do that. Um, if you move towards BIM as output, I think there's actually a different workflow that happens is that there's a need on the research side, and this is some that we're doing now, um, about creating these configurators or design platforms that have embedded constraints or predefinition of the manufacturing and assembly um, requirements that exist. Um, I put it cloud-based because it's very possible that it's just for synchronization, it's easier in the cloud. You can still interface with legacy design softwares like Revit through APIs. You can also do it in a browser-based, like lightweight configuration platform. It doesn't have to be done with, with Revit. Um, don't tell my friends at Autodesk I said that. Um, and, and then downstream, um, you can have uh, kind of the output being the manufacturing, the build materials, the assembly, the, the sequencing scripts, uh, you know, the G code, whatever it is. And then your permit drawings can be automated from this process. So you go through structural calculations, um, you know, maybe the IFC files come out and then can be used, these bins can be used for um, further uh, planning or scheduling or something like this. Um, so this is just like a conceptual idea, but we're really working on um, thinking about these configuration rules um, and, and what they might need to look like to create these fabrication aware design tools. Um, the second one is uh, is really a, around this topic of sustainability. We actually um, were awarded a, a global research challenge from from Arup in 2018. Um, I put a, I put a link because the report is will be out I think by the time this video gets gets released. Uh, so we're we're done. We're just getting it published. Um, and there's a pre version here on this link. Um, but you, if you want to search for the final version, I'm sure it will be around. Um, and so we really looked at kind of products and sustainability, but we also looked at ecosystems for um, industrialized construction and developing economies. The operating thesis is basically, um, we don't have the materials to build like we've done in, in the West um, for, the, for the rest of the world. Uh, we just will not have the materials if uh, we won't have the sand, we won't have, we don't have the carbon budget. Um, and so it was meant to kind of open up the conversation, what would an industrialized construction future help with that um, kind of dematerialization or, or less materials required? Um, it's some early work. Um, I think we're trying to be very sensitive also to the political um, and social implications of housing. Um, uh, you know, the, the lead researcher, she's um, from Ethiopia that's been doing this work. Um, but we looked at three, um, three uh, cities, so Addis Ababa, um, Nairobi, and Cape Town, and we tried to understand um, how are they adopting industrialized construction, okay. and what are the opportunities for this uh, sustainable transition. And what I don't have here on the slide is we're also doing some work around circular economy. Um, if, uh, if, if listeners aren't familiar with the idea of circular economy, it's the idea that you don't kind of take a linear economy where you take, make, 
and dispose of materials, uh, use and dispose of materials, but instead you actually design feedback loops for materials. Um, and there's been a lot of work on, on circular economy in the built environment, but I always argue that it's held back by, again, this project-based um, focus. And uh, I actually think there's a really strong connection between circular economy and industrialized supply chains, because you have, in no other area of the built environment, you have better understanding and control of the supply chain. Um, so circular economy and the idea that you could design your product for disassembly using a product platform really makes a lot of sense with industrialized construction. So we looked at three case studies in Switzerland. There were three really interesting pilot projects that have been done in the last few years. Um, and uh, we've kind of tried to abstract some principles um, for circular economy and industrialized construction. And we'll have some papers coming out probably in the next uh, three to six months about this. Um, so we're really excited about this in the future. Um, I guess the last point on the circular economy side is that we're also using some of our work on blockchain um, to think about how would you securitize the material passports um, and even think about making them tradable assets um, so that you can then monetize and trade those assets in the future. So we're, we're excited about that, but that's just starting. So we've got a ways to go. Um, yeah, and then finally, I uh, uh, or it's, you know, I don't want to take too long, but this one's pretty quick. Um, I think there's something between what we've seen at NCCR, digital fabrication, and offsite. Um, you know, on the left, the digital fabrication work that we're doing in Switzerland is is really highly bespoke, and it's it's not, uh, I would say, not ready for the larger market yet. But it offers a level of customization and um, and design freedom that's really attractive. On the right side, you know, industrialized construction, offsite, modular, um, really offers high productivity. But if it's not done well, it can it can often lead to kind of uh, you know cookie cutter buildings or just boxes stacked upon boxes, which you know is also what we don't want. Um, I think this idea of platforms, mass customization, which we're really interested in, moves the conversation on the right side. Um, but I'm really interested in this gap in the middle. So. What is, what is this thing in the middle? And I don't know exactly what it is yet, but how can you get really um, the, the interesting freedom, design freedom from digital fabrication and robotics while still keeping the productivity um, um, that comes from offsite? So I think that will be really interesting. And finally, um, I think, you know, I have questions about what will, will there be disruption of the industry from future entrepreneurs? So in my class, now I teach industrialized construction. Um, this is a class tour to uh, Arne, one of those innovative um, timber fabricating partners we have here in Switzerland. Um, and I asked my students to propose their new startup for industrialized construction. Um, so these are uh, last year. Actually, we just had on, on Monday, we just had the final submissions. So I didn't have a chance to put them together. But the idea is that, the, you know, this is from last year. Can they propose a new kind of industrialized construction company? And these are... Um, a mix of students from structural engineering, construction, and architecture, um, and what would be your business model in order to bring that to the market? So um, I don't know if, we're, if we are really facing industry disruption for sure or not, but um, I think getting young entrepreneurs to think and students to think in that mindset um, is a really interesting and exciting um, um, place to be for our teaching. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the that's the quick rundown of, of, of some of the things we're doing. We have a lot more, but uh, I only had so much time. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. You know, that space that you had talked mm -hmm. about, Daniel, really interesting between what might be called, um, you know, digi, digi fab and that whole phenomenon of, of use, utilizing robotics in order to produce um, architectural outputs, uh, highly bespoke architectural outputs, and what might be considered a uh, very regimented uh, set of parameters that does not give you a lot of flexibility in that space. Uh, Helena Ludlo at, at Linbax talks a lot about the concept of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the sliding scale of opportunities between made to stock, made to order, engineered to order, and uh, how really what plays into that is the level of customer or client inputs into that process, right? And so I think implicit in all of this is the question of how might we take customer experience, user experience that has been uh, really well teased out in research in say industri in, in industrial design or product design and how, how do we adopt these principles into the construction industry and no one's done a really good job of that yet. You know, there's a lot of space for research in there and I, I think 
your group is is seems to be trying to tackle that topic in particular. It'd be really interesting to see how that plays out over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thanks. it's very architect driven, <laughs> as opposed to custom driven. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, right? Sorry. I mean, I, when yeah. I was at Stanford, I, I, I taught at the Stanford D School. Um, uh, you know, I, I did some of this user-centered um, um, design. And I, I, think, I think we will start to see a lot more of this user-centered design um, uh, and kind of asking who is the real customer here. Um, I think we're not so good at understanding customers in construction, right? The general contractor never thinks, well, I'm being very, I'm being very simplistic, so I don't want to be too harsh, but, you know, often the, the customer for the general contractor is the, is the owner, right? They're the owner that's procuring the building, but that's, and that's true, that is the customer, but that's very different than the user, than the person that's going to be inhabiting the space. Um, and I would say that architects and contractors we're not necessarily trained to, um, to well, architects are better. Um, I would say I'm not an architect, so I don't know, but, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, I'm trying to be a little bit delicate because, uh, you know, crossing so many different boundaries and disciplines. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think, um, I, I think that we will start to see direct sales to customer models emerge um, yeah. with yeah. with kind of customized um, uh, options, mass mass configuration or, or something beyond that. Um, uh, I, I just see that people will want to have the ability to go online, configure their home, put on their VR goggles and see how the different designs look and push by. Um, maybe it's a crazy idea because the house is a really expensive thing, but um, there are actually companies right now that are emerging. Um, I saw one the other day. I can't remember what it is, but they're a startup that's basically trying to be the broker that deals with a customer so they can deal with this mess of architecture, uh, contractor, land, permitting. Um, you know, they're basically my, um, um, being the owner representative for a, a customized house because the process is so complex. And I just see the uh, yeah, and industrial can, building lends itself to that, not just as it to a kind of a, a production efficiency, but to a consumption efficiency. And that's been an argument for a long time. But architects, contractors, manufacturers have not really taken that on. So I mean, in Japan, it's interesting, both your circular economy interests and your and this idea of the customer inputs, we've seen both of those developed very, you know, very in a very mature level of Japan, a high, you know, high level of very direct customer interface and customer yeah. experience. The customer's heard, uh, actually architects, you know, we've seen this for some of the bigger companies, Seki Sui House, Seki Sui Hai, where it's a one-to-one -one customer based experience for a highly standardized and highly customized product. And also what we've seen too, which is what you brought up as well. We've seen, you know, they, they've developed a circular economy precisely because they industrial production, not only does it lend, it lends itself to knowing exactly where all your nuts and bolts are. So we've seen that in uh, Seki Stui Heim, which is, we think, one of the largest, if not the largest volumetric modular company. 19% of their profits now come from basically the circular economy. So they've commercialized. Yeah. So I mean, again, I find it, I was going to actually ask maybe as a wrap up too, is like you come from, uh, you, it's interesting to me, and it makes so much sense seeing all your work, is that you don't come from industrialized construction. I think that's the advantage. <laughs> you, come you come from integrated mm -hmm. product delivery. Which keeps yeah. you honest. You know, we, you know, Orion and I get in trouble because we, you know, we do like industrialized construction, but we also are very critical of it, and for similar reasons. And it's really refreshing to see that full circle in all of your approaches, which is that you genuinely are finding what's valuable in industrialized construction, which doesn't mean it's a, it's not an automatic. It really requires vertical integration. It requires customer centric issues. It requires all these things. It does them better than conventional construction. But it doesn't really mean that just by putting things in a factory, but getting a robot, are you going to achieve any of these things? And I mean, maybe it's worth thinking about that. I mean, I'd love to, you know, coming back to this question of, inter you know, integrated product delivery, like, what do you see, you know, what do you see, what are the kind of high points of industrialist construction that, it, you know, that might actually change all of construction in a way? Like, what are the kind of discipline, the kind of discipline yeah. that of industrialist construction? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Um, I, I I've I'm I'm actually you know I, I when I point out these business models I'm I'm also I, and I didn't do it this time but I'm careful to say these uh, these different business models have strengths and they have weaknesses and vertical integration has a weakness of of stranded capital puts a lot of money into a factory 
And we will see in coronavirus what that does for vertically integrated companies if there's less demand. So what will Katera do? Um, you know, if if demand drops right now, you know, it seems we're in the U.S. so far behind in housing. I still think um, it will be okay for a while. Um, but you know, what will happen with that stranded capital? Um, construction industry has been highly fragmented um, and and capital investment averse for a long time for good reasons, like because of this this boom and bust cycle, um, and and for other reasons as well. Um, and so, kind of coming back to the IPD. Um, yeah, I, I think what we're now seeing is is kind of uh, uh, what what I'm seeing is that there are players that were in the IPD game that are looking towards industrialized construction and doing it as a continuation of IPD and not as a vertically integrated model. So what they're basically doing is they're creating a joint um, system. They're really trying to find a way that that different players, different suppliers, can work together. But the, the biggest difference in industrialized construction is it requires kind of long-term supply chain continuity. I think back to what uh, Jörg Lessing points out in his kind of framework for industrialized construction. Um, you, need, you need supply chain partnerships. And so these companies, you know, kind of through a general contractor or, or maybe through an owner, um, are, are putting together plans to, okay, we're going to use this wall system, we're going to use this frame system, but we'll kind of create a synergy and we'll use it for the next four, five, six projects um, or, or, or more. And I think that's kind of the evolution from IPD, which was, um, which was always fragmented from project to project. Um, I think that is the solution and, and a, a capital light solution. Um, I know that some some uh, com some kind of gr groups in uh, in Central Europe are also thinking about this approach. So um, there are different approaches here, and I and I want to be careful that you know while vertical integration and lots of money makes makes some big headlines and lets you go really fast um, in the long term, you know it's yet to be seen what's going to be the most effective way. Um, yeah, and I, and I think the the other point is about kind of not coming from an industrialized construction starting point. What I'm really interested in is systems level optimization. And industrialized construction provides an opportunity to redefine the system and re-optimize the system because we've gotten all the optimization we we're gonna get out of the old kind of stick yeah. built system. There's not so much more you can do. <laughs> um, you know, local innovation, incremental innovation only takes you so far. At some point you have to stop, redesign the system, um, and then optimize again from that point forward. And I think that's what this kind of reset of industrialized construction has done. Um, and then I'm excited to see what will come out of that. You know, what kind of optimizations can, can move forward with that. Awesome. Daniel, really awesome discussion. And uh, I think we could spend two, three more hours unpacking <laughs> these theories. Um, you know, and, and just want to publicly thank all the industry partners that Daniel and, and Ivan and I and, and other academics work with. Uh, we know that at the end of the day, that's where the rubber hits the road and, and where, where uh, you put your money where your mouth is. So uh, really appreciate you willing to come and talk with us, Daniel. And um, that's ModX Voices here today. And we'll catch everyone next time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.